let's talk about creating healthy environments outside of the home. Once we felt confident about maintaining a safe environment inside of our home, we found a daily rhythm and our days felt easier. Once we got into a flow, our new choices meant my anxious mind had fewer options to feed on, at least until I had to think about the potential environments Ollie would spend time in outside of our home. Where could I take him where he'd be safe? At playgrounds and mommy and me get-togethers, I worried about who had just touched whatever Ollie now wanted to touch. The jungle gym, restaurant tables, high chairs, swings, another child's toy. Thankfully, these concerns subsided slightly after he started oral immunotherapy, and I knew he could tolerate small amounts of allergens. But before then, almost every place outside of our home seemed to be covered in red flags. An ice cream shop near us had a picture of an ice cream scoop covered in peanuts in its window marketing, and I had such a strong somatic response to the image, I physically diverted our stroller because I didn't want Ollie near the picture of peanuts. I know, it's so crazy. It's easy to see or imagine red flags everywhere, but I tried to treat the manageable ones as what they are, manageable. When Ollie was invited to a play date, I wouldn't let fear overwhelm me and choose to stay home. The last thing I wanted was to restrict his ability to make friends and play the way all kids need for healthy development. So whenever he had a play date, I packed his auto injectors, a meal or snacks for him, and brought him to his friend's house. When Ollie was younger, I was always present at the play dates. But as he got older, I felt more comfortable dropping him off and switching childcare for a few hours with other moms because we all know we need that. In that case, I discussed his allergies with the parent or caregiver and gave them a copy of his emergency action plan if they felt like they needed to review his allergies more carefully. You can find that resource in the course introduction. When I drop Ollie off at his friend's house, I usually ask if anyone in the house ate peanut butter, cashews, or pistachios, his allergens, before we came over. And if someone had, I would just ask that they kindly wash their hands and mouths before they start playing, really simply. Before leaving Ollie, I remind his friends and their parent or caregiver about his allergies and ask that he only eat the foods I packed for him. Usually I say something like, okay, everyone eats what's on their plates because we wanna make sure everyone's eating food that's right for their bodies. This is always case by case and I always recommend you do whatever works for you and your family and your comfort level. Navigating all of this was not easy. It required a lot, a lot of bravery, but it was much easier than the colossal decision looming over me. Where was I gonna send Oliver to school? The school I'd wanted him to attend before his food allergy diagnosis was no longer an option. They allowed nuts in the school, which was unsafe for Oliver, though the school did separate the kids with and without allergies during meal and snack times. While that might be comforting to some parents, I interviewed Dr. Eilat Fishbach for my podcast and learned that this approach could do more harm than good. Dr. Fishbach explains that when children share meals that everyone can eat, often called inclusive eating, it supports the social well being of the child with food allergies and the social well being of the other children. Through her research, she discovered that children who ate the same foods and weren't isolated from each other during mealtime, when people often connect the most, were more likely to thrive socially. In other words, we should all want school food policies to be inclusive because it benefits everyone. If this type of school isn't an option for you, don't fret. You can replicate this environment by hosting mealtime, playdates, or picnics at the park with understanding friends. Check out my fascinating podcast with Dr. Fishbach to learn more about this in other areas of her research. In life, as I'm sure you have, I've been in many situations that required me to be brave, leading thousands of women through vinyasas during my topless yoga events, which is a bras on, bellies out self-confidence event, working with casting agents and top photographers who openly criticize my body, quitting social media for a while, sharing my lifelong struggle with disordered eating and running the Paris Marathon. Even after all that and all the stuff I've left out, which you can read about on my blog, 
Finding the right school for Ollie required the most bravery of all. Making sure Ollie's school was safe for him was life or death. I couldn't worry about being perceived as overbearing, annoying, or condescending as I visited schools, requested tours of the entire facility instead of just the part they wanted to show me, and met with administrators and faculty. I approached all of my school interactions with love and kindness, and I was also firm and made sure that all of my questions were answered. Looking for a school for Ollie was often frustrating. I'd get excited about a place and then visit it and realize it would never work. There were food inclusivity issues as well as many others. Once before a school visit that seemed promising, our in-person tour revealed that it had old rugs, worn carpets, and dusty curtains everywhere. This particular school was an automatic no because of the inevitability of dust mites, and it also smelled like bleach, which may be an excellent disinfectant, but terrible for our respiratory systems. I asked so many questions over and over. Exactly how did teachers and care providers respond to medical emergencies? What process and emergency action protocol did the school follow when there was an emergency? Was the school registered as a school or a daycare? This can make a significant difference in the amount of emergency response training staff has. What was the school legally able to do to protect my child from an allergic reaction if he had one when he's not in my care? Was the entire staff CPR trained? Were they trained and confident on how to administer epinephrine? Could I advocate for my child at that school and know that my concerns were being heard and acted on? I have a podcast episode with the Elijah Alavi Foundation on creating safe environments that's a must listen. It is gutting, but it's vital. We must do better, expect better, and advocate for our child who is just as valuable as every other child in the environment that they're in. Do not settle, you are protecting your child. Speak up for your child who needs you by voicing things like, my kid has a peanut and tree nut allergy. Does anyone else in this class have food allergies? Can we all agree to leave these allergens at home? Fantastic, this is wonderful that we can all do this together to support our kids, thank you. Now's a great time to talk about restaurants. Here are some tips from my experience. Before going to a restaurant, check out the menu online and see what ingredients they keep in the kitchen based on the menu items. Call ahead and ask about their food allergy protocol. What foods go into their fryer? Can they use a separate sanitary surface and clean knives, for example, for your child's meal prep? When we arrive at a restaurant, we ask the host to speak directly to the manager so we can tell him or her that we have food allergies in the same way we would alert him if our table had a birthday. We have a food allergy at our table. Okay, maybe not that thrilling and exciting, but we do mention it. As I mentioned before, allergenic proteins can only be removed from surfaces with soap and water. So we kindly asked the staff to clean the table well before we sit down. When Ollie was in a high chair, I would bring a lobster clip-on high chair or a cloth covering for the restaurant chair to ensure he wasn't sitting in another child's allergens. When we were practicing strict avoidance, we also would bring Ollie's food if the restaurant couldn't provide a safe meal for him. We let our server know what specific allergies our table has when ordering. When the food is delivered, we triple check and ensure the food is prepared correctly. Again, you are not annoying or a nuisance when you do this. You are protecting your child's life. FAIR, which I mentioned earlier, also offers food allergy restaurant cards in many languages that you can bring with you and share with the wait staff and kitchen. I've included a link to these cards in this module's resources. Do whatever you need to feel comfortable dining out with your child. My friend Monica, a registered dietitian and food allergy mom, will march right into the kitchen to ensure her child's food is safely prepared. Dining out at restaurants is hard enough with a child. My advice is to prepare your food if necessary, know how to use your auto injector, ask questions and triple check everything with your server and manager. Before we end, I wanna share some sacrifices we recently made so we could give Ollie a home environment that's even safer for him and better supports his whole body health. The changes I discussed making to our home at the start of this chapter absolutely contributed to the health and well-being of Ollie and our family. But 
We couldn't change Florida's environment where we were currently living, which for him was toxic. His body constantly fought all of the pollen, heat, humidity, and mold attacking his immune system. He couldn't fully heal there, and he was miserable. At the COVID-19 pandemic start, Ollie's environmental reactions were so severe that his eyes were swollen shut and he constantly had other reactive symptoms. Nothing we did would calm his symptoms down and it was torture to watch him suffer. I knew I had to get him out of Florida. So during COVID, the two of us flew to DC where my family is. It was difficult, but I decided the risk was worth it. There was no way that he'd get better if we stayed put. We spent a few months in DC while Matt stayed in Florida. And during that time, Ollie started to heal. There were far fewer environmental allergens for him there, and he had fewer reactions. When he did have them, they were much milder. Usually nothing a little Zyrtec couldn't help. The difference was so profound that Matt and I decided to permanently, at least for now, move to DC, something we never imagined doing or wanting to do. It was such a tough decision. We loved Florida and had built what was once our dream home and life there. While deciding to move to Washington, D.C. was challenging, it was also very exciting for me. But it wasn't the hardest decision we had to make in this process. The most challenging thing that we decided to do was to rehome our beloved dog, Spunky, with a friend who adored him. Spunky was with Matt while Ollie and I were in D.C., and because Ollie was doing so much better, we had him tested for dog allergies and learned he was highly allergic to dogs. That was another reason why Ollie was having fewer reactions while we were in Washington, D.C. Spunky was all over everything. The sofa, the bed, the floor, the furniture. And Ollie was all over Spunky. We didn't want Ollie to think he had anything to do with Spunky being rehomed, so we told him Spunky needed to stay in Miami with his dog family. Ollie was sad, but this made sense to him. On his own, he made the connection that it would be wrong to take Spunky from his family just like it would be wrong if someone took Ollie from our family. Rehoming our dog was heartbreaking. We all loved him so much, but I knew it was the right decision. Ollie's improved health makes that clear every day. We even consider getting a hypoallergenic dog, but when we brought Ollie around my friends, he still broke out in hives from its chew toy. Even hypoallergenic dogs have dander and pick things up in their saliva. Maybe someday a dog will be a part of our family again, but for now, we're making do with the battery-powered versions and lots of stuffed animals. These changes weren't easy. Whenever we made another sacrifice to improve our lives and Ollie's health, I told myself, it's okay to feel sad. You can make the right decision and still feel sad. This helped sustain my hope that things will get better and keep improving little by little, day by day decision by decision. I know this seems like a lot of information, but remember the mantra, keep it simple and take it one decision at a time. <music>